We worship a risen Savior. Whether you're with us this morning in person or joining us online, thank you for joining us. It's our hope that as you've joined us today, that you feel the love of Jesus. Normally, we have additional ministries available to each of you on Sunday mornings so that you can grow deeper in your walk with Jesus. But because of our special Easter morning with two services today, these ministries will happen next week and not today. We offer BLTs, Body Life Teams, for adults and kids before service at 9 a.m. There's nursery care for our babies available during the BLT hour and church. However, our nursery is available for you this morning. The nursery is located at the west end of the building. There's kids church for ages five years through grade four that we normally dismiss throughout the service. They sing, hear the message about Jesus, and have a really fun time together. During the week, 
There are life groups for adults for you to join to meet throughout the week, either here at the church or in their homes. A Bible study for both men and women meet on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m., as well as our Purpose Youth Group. So if you have any kids that are between the ages of 5th and 12th grade, we welcome them to join the fun. Now, one of our ushers gave you a program as you came in that has info and activities going on here at DCOG. However, here are some things we would like for you to be aware of. This coming Wednesday night, for one hour only, we will be having an open house to our community. You are invited to come and enjoy refreshments while meeting our children's director for daycare, preschool, and our children's church ministry director. Come and see the many events happening here and observe the newly remodeled facility. We are still in construction on a few things, but we want to celebrate what has already taken place. Mark your calendars. Plan to join us this Wednesday night, April the 7th, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. We'll see you here. Our men's retreat is coming up this coming Friday and Saturday, April 9th and 10th at Yellow Creek Lake Campgrounds by Silver Lake. The cost is $20 per guy and $10 for their sons if they're 12 years and older. There will be a devotional study, ribeye steak and shrimp dinner on Friday night, which begins at 6.30 p.m. There'll be games and fun and work project for a few hours to help beautify the campgrounds. We will finish Saturday around 1 p.m. You can sign up at the Connect and Grow stations and the welcome team can help you with that. Don't miss out on the fun, guys. Sign up today or by Thursday of this week. See Pastor Jamie for any details. We hope to see you there, guys. We will once again be having the Jerry Mitchell Wild Game Supper. It'll be Thursday, April 15th at 6 p.m. here at DCOG in the Fellowship Hall. Come on out for some great food, fellowship, and sharing from our guest speaker, Reverend Mark Nielsen. There'll be the fish and other normal meats, as well as some exotic and special meats to try. There'll be some sides and the special, quote, mystery meat you can try if you're adventurous. Don't miss out, guys. There's no cost, just a free will donation to cover the cost and to help out next year's Wild Game Supper. See Jason Egley if you have any meat, want to help donate funds, or can help work the event. Come on out and join the fun April 15th, Thursday at 6 p.m. We will once again be having our all-church golf outing. This is for both men and women. It will be on Saturday, May the 1st at 9.45 a.m. There will be no groups ahead of us, I promise. This will be a cross creek with tons of prizes, closest to the pen, longest drive, longest putt, as well as prizes for the top three teams. There will be ladies selling their legendary lemon shake-ups on the course as we play, as well as food and snacks and drinks that will be inclusive and provided to keep you hydrated and well fed. There'll be a lunch provided at the end of the round here at the church. We'll be handing out our prizes there. The cost is $15 per person to enter, as well as your car and green fee. We will be getting a discounted rate for our fees to the course. You may sign up at the Connect and Grow stations or on our website. Sign up as a team, or if you're an individual, we will put a team together for you if needed. Don't miss out on the fun and sign up after service today. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. Although we may distance from each other physically, we now draw close together as we draw closer and worship Jesus, for He is our reason for gathering and deserves all our praise and glory and honor. It was Friday afternoon 
And Jesus is dead. His brutalized body hanging without life on a cross dropped into a hole in the dirt. His executioners had dug the holes, prepared the place, and done their job with ruthless efficiency. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. The hope of mankind overcome by powers of hell, by the shadow of a grave. We once knew what it was like to rule and reign on the earth. We were made to live in the light, in relationship, in purpose. We were made for more than what we've come to accept as normal. Ever since the garden, Satan and his kingdom have been tightening their grip. Darkness has ruled evil, chaos, suffering, hopelessness. We've been enslaved and crippled by the holes the enemy has been digging for us too. But instead of killing the Messiah, the cross became a catalyst for salvation. The hole that was dug to hold an instrument of shame and death was instead filled with an instrument to bring healing and new life. That's the way God is. Nothing is impossible with him. He's always restoring, always renewing, always able to take what was meant for evil and turn it for good, to take our graves and turn them into gardens. Why? Because he never gave up on his plan. He has never given up on us. He knows what we don't, that you can't have resurrection life without death, Jesus. He died so we can have lives of purpose and power over the grave. He is not dead. He is alive. And because he lives, we can live again. I was breathing the night alive. Come on. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my dream till I met you. Cause when you call my name, come on, church.
<laughs> Do I need a new battery? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Lord understands, you know. We welcome all of you uh, in gathering here today. And those of you who are online, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry you probably missed that prayer, but we're glad that you have joined us and we welcome you. And I just want to make a few brief uh, announcements to go along with what you've already seen, perhaps. And that is, uh, when you leave today, please fill out this uh, welcome, uh, this connection card, and give us your name, address, phone number, social security. No, not that. Um, <laughs> just let us know you are here. And for those of you who are here all the time, uh, we would love to be able to update our information uh, just to check it, make sure it's all correct. So please, everyone, fill that out. Turn it in at the Welcome uh, uh, Center there as you leave today. And um, then also, all youth, beginning with fifth grade and going up through the 12th grade, as you leave today, we have a very special gift for you. It's in a bag, and uh, this will go with you the rest of your life, I'm confident. So be sure to pick yours up. And if you're a parent or grandparent and your high schooler or uh, youth wasn't able to come today, you pick one up for them, okay? Even if they don't go to church here, you pick one up and you give it to them on behalf of our youth ministries here at Decatur Church of God. It's a great gift, I assure you. And then uh, open houses this Wednesday, so everybody can come in between 6.30 and 7.30 and see our children's ministry and what they provide. It's incredible what they do day after day after day and on weekends and Wednesday evening. So you all come. It's not just for uh, daycare and preschool. It's for the whole church. You come and see what goes on and what's available in our children's ministry. And um, uh, also you'll see some of our other ministries, youth ministries and so forth, uh, doing what they do on Wednesday night. So you all come. There's going to be uh, refreshments. It's going to be a wonderful evening together. And then uh, finally, I want to uh, remind them, the men of our wild game night. We have a great, great speaker for that night. But uh, he will be about as great as the food that we're going to have. And that's going to be unusual, some of it. But it's always good, and it's great fellowship, and our speaker, Reverend Mark Nielsen, is going to challenge us. So thank you again for being with us today. May God be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name. has changed since last Easter. The world has been shaken. Life has been disrupted. What we once called normal seems like it may never return. It's been easy to be discouraged, to lose hope, to feel the foundations of our faith begin to crumble. It's hard to keep our feet planted when the ground beneath feels like shifting sand. Now more than ever, we need to stand on the truth of Easter, a day which changed our eternity, changed our world forever. Death was defeated by life. Sin was consumed by mercy. The grave was swallowed up by victory. See, even in the darkest of moments, the love of Jesus could not be stopped. His faithfulness could not be broken. And when the dust settled, Jesus, he stood alive and victorious. Today, may we remember the truth of Easter, the power of the resurrection, and the promise of eternity. Yes, the world has been shaken, but the grave it's still empty. And Jesus, he's still risen. Alone the mind. 
sorrow dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to be in Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested in my life was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested in my life began oh your grace so Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. He faithfully. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes. You're in the slum, it's your man. Last love, pouring down us. You have made me new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had fallen.
I remember when my friend wrote this, she sent it to me on a CD and she said, what do you think? There were six songs on there and there was only one I just kept gravitating towards and it was this one.
Let us pray. What wondrous love you have given to us, that you would send your own son to die on the cross for our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and give us the hope of eternal life. And we celebrate that today, Father. We thank you for loving us, for sending your son to the world that you love. Today, as we have gathered together, there are many needs represented here. You're aware of each and every one of them, and we want to ask, Father, that as we lift them up to you, you will give your grace and your comfort and your strength to each of these requests that are upon our hearts, upon the lives of those who are listed in our worship folder. Father, anoint them with your mercy and love and healing encouragement or direction or guidance in life. Bring hope and reconciliation where it's needed. Bring joy where there is defeat. Father, we know you can do all things. If you can bring your son out of the grave, there is nothing you cannot do in our lives. So help us just to be be willing to let you work in our lives that miracle you are wanting to do and point us the direction you have planned for us since the moment we were conceived in our mother's womb. Lord, today we think especially of Naomi Cook and their family in the, in the home going of Mike Cook our dear brother in the Lord who has been a great inspiration to all of us but his battle on earth is over and victory is his and we celebrate with him today. We thank you that we know he's in your presence this Easter morn. And we pray for Naomi and the family that you will comfort them and encourage them as they remember all the good memories that they have shared together and as they all look to that day when they too will meet you face to face, as all of us will. Lord, may we look forward to that day because of what you've done on Calvary. For the privilege of being part of your mission here on earth, we give you thanks. We have given our offerings and tithes to you. I thank you for this wonderful church, so faithful in that discipline and that conviction of faith. And we know, Lord, that what you're doing through this church is going around the world. We can't see everything that it impacts, but we know, Lord, that you are using it for your glory. We pray for our missionaries around the world whom we support, encourage them. Strengthen them and guide them as they do this work in a different culture. For each one who is given, bless the gift and the giver. We will give your name all the praise. Amen. And so, here we sit. Some of us have done this every week for as long as we can remember. For some of us, this is the one day a year we attend. Some of us were invited by a friend and we had the courage to actually say yes. And some of us simply showed up, almost by accident. Easter, Jesus died, Jesus rose again, and Jesus wants to live in us. We know that something deep inside of us should jump when we hear those words. We want our souls to be shaken because He is risen. But many of us have been burned by religion, or by church, and it's more difficult than ever for us to take an unbiased look at it all again. Others of us have heard the Easter message so much, we've simply become numb to its life-changing potential. Don't get me wrong. We wish the message of Christ's resurrection could change us, really change us today. Not because of something we conjure up in and of ourselves, but because we literally receive new and abundant life. We are tired of faking it. We are tired of wearing masks, and we are tired of acting. And so, here we sit. Easter. What can Christ's resurrection possibly mean to us today? I mean, can that single event literally hold the power to change my life? Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus wants to live in us. So what do we do now? praise 
faces One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is he The Word became flesh, the light shine among us His glory revealed, cause living he loved me Dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away Rising he justified One day he's coming 
Folks, will you uh, help me to thank uh, Pastor Jamie and the worship team today for leading us so beautifully? <clears throat> Easter eggs, bunnies, flowers, robins. All are symbols of springtime and renewal. But the greatest symbol for those who believe in Christ is the empty tomb. It is open for the world to see. It is empty for all to believe. Though there were many skeptics at first sunrise, there was never a body. Twenty centuries later, no one has ever produced the bones. The misinformation which began by the Jewish leaders of that day to cover up the incomprehensible work of God continues to the present day by those who reject the truth. However, the reality then is as it is today. Christ has risen. He's alive. Amen. And he's alive. He's alive, folks. Amen. It cannot be denied. Jesus Christ lives. That truth was validated by the women who visited the tomb on that uh, first dawn of the resurrection. And by the disciples who confirmed their report. This was a profound radical change from the norm. It's unexplainable until you factor in the divine. Consider these facts as given by J.P. Moreland, distinguished professor of philosophy, theologian and apologist of the Christian faith at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. He gives us five points. He says... The disciples were in a unique position to know whether the resurrection happened, and they went to their deaths for proclaiming it was true. Now, how many of you would die for something you knew wasn't true? Apart from the resurrection, he says, there's no good reason why such skeptics like James, the half-brother of Christ, and Paul or Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee and a legalist of his day, why would they give their lives for this message that Jesus is alive? Why did they convert and why would they die for this faith? Within weeks of the crucifixion, thousands of Jews became convinced Jesus was the Son of God and began following him abandoning key social and religious practices, risking social and physical damnation in their culture, and even death within weeks. The early sacraments of communion and baptism were established in that first century church early on, right at the very beginning of the gathering of God's people, Christ followers. And even today, we, ex we exclaim his victory as we observe and proclaim his resurrection and death, death and resurrection through these sacraments. Finally, he writes, the miraculous emergence of the church in the face of brutal Roman persecution rips a great hole in history, a hole the size and shape of the resurrection. The end of that first century especially, there was tremendous persecution. We read about it in Revelation, and I will be leading a study in Revelation on Wednesday evenings beginning the second Wednesday of May. I hope you can attend. But they were going through tremendous persecution, and the main message of Revelation to them, to the people of that day, was stand firm, hold on, 
continue in the faith regardless what you face. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The empty tomb is a symbol of that truth. It's a symbol of that truth which guides all of life and this universe. There was something else, though, that began that first Easter morn. It continues to this day. Not only the truth that it represents, but the transformation of lives. In the days and the weeks, the months and the years, now centuries, following that first Easter morn, the skeptics and naysayers have not been able to explain one obvious fact. That fact is that those who encounter the resurrected Christ experience a profound radical change in their lives as well. The Jewish leaders over the couple months, even on beyond the, uh, the day of Pentecost, spoke of the resurrection and, and it confirmed to them and to all who saw them that Jesus is alive. In Acts 4.13, the Jewish leaders had to admit when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they who were unschooled, ordinary men, were, uh, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Transformation. Profound, radical change. That's the definition of transformation. Easter is all about transformation. Changing our lives from the way it was to a new life of hope, changing our lives from sin to a new life of spiritual morality and hope and clean living, transformation. Beginning at the empty tomb, hope comes forth through the transformation that Christ gives. When he comes into lives wrecked by life's circumstances, and enslaved by sin, he transforms them. He makes us new creations. It is, as Paul said, from his own personal experience. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. The truth is, we are celebrating with the same power that brought Jesus out of the tomb. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is able to bring people out of the spiritual death into new life, giving them hope for a better life. And anyone can have this hope who surrenders to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. It's for anyone. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with the congregation a brief look at the life of Miles McPherson and recommended his book, Do Something. I have a copy here. Do Something. Make your life count. In fact, I uh, have taken it upon myself in faith to order 20 books at $15 each because I think you're going to want it. Next week, these will be available in the gathering. You just go in there and put your $15 or whatever you can spare into the box. Pick up your book, but it's limited. First 20 gets a book. Just don't beat each other up trying to get to it, okay? It's a great book. I'm halfway through it. it. It has stirred my soul. And I think it expresses what the nature of this church is and what God is preparing us to be. Do something. Miles, as I shared 
couple weeks ago, is the senior pastor of the Rock Church in San Diego, one of the fastest growing churches in the country. He grew up in Manhattan, Long Island, went to college at University of New Haven, and became the very first NFL draft cho cho uh, choice from that university. And he played for the San Diego Chargers. In his first two years as a pro, he became a slave to drugs and an immoral lifestyle. And late one night at a drug-filled apartment, he looked at some folks stoned out of their minds. And he knew it was only a matter of time when he would be just like them. And eventually it would kill him. He prayed. He prayed out to God for deliverance at that very moment. And as he prayed, he was immediately delivered from drugs and his life was radically transformed. He no longer was the person he had, had been. He had been changed. And his book challenges us to allow God to do that work in our lives too. And then as we do... God can help us to discover the very purpose for which he placed us on earth to fulfill. He has a purpose for your life. Do something. Oh, but you may say, uh, Miles, let's face it, he was a football standout. No wonder he became so famous and a pastor of a big church and he writes his best-selling books. But who am I? I'm just a nobody. What can God do with me? Hmm. Others may say, well, I'm hopeless. I mean, my life's a mess. And it'll never get better. There's no hope. Oh, but my friend, that's not what the Bible says. Nor is it the testimony of millions of people through the ages. Even in this room, there are many testimonies that prove otherwise, that prove there's always hope when you turn your life over to Jesus Christ. The end of June, I will be on vacation and miss one Sunday, but I've scheduled to speak here in my place two men who stand as pillars of hope in Northeast Indiana. One of them will share his testimony how he was hopelessly lost in sin. He was a slave to drugs and a pawn in the drug cartel on our country's southern border. And when all hope seemed to be gone, he found Jesus Christ. He found hope and recovery to the, through the risen Savior. Changed his life. You don't want to miss it. June 27th, be here and listen to the power of, of the testimony of this man. My wife and I uh, went to Nashville for a, uh, for a conference with Celebrate Recovery, and he was on our team. We saw firsthand the, the radiant testimony of this man who had been lost. I mean, he was, he was at death's door. You will see a picture of him before and after. And it, it just, it's jaw-dropping. You've got to be here to listen to his testimony. It will give you hope, and you'll say, if God can do that for a man who is about to die, what can he do with me? Be here. I can personally vouch for the hope that Jesus Christ gives, or I would not be standing here today. I don't have a grand testimony like Miles or many others. I can only say that my parents led me to a personal relationship and decision to follow Jesus Christ when I was five years old. <laughs> Hardly a theologian at that point. <laughs> what, what could I possibly understand in the ramifications of that decision but this I can tell you it worked it stuck in my life Jesus Christ has led me and guided me all the way he has nurtured me 
through Christian parents and an incredible church family. And I have found hope in Christ all my life, no matter what I have faced, sometimes needing direction, finding my life's mate, raising a family, facing financial hardship, betrayal by friends and loss of loved ones, uncertain futures. Christ has always been with me. Whether it was in this country or whether it was in the jungles of Africa during turbulent times as missionaries, Christ has always given me hope. He has never left me. His promise is this. Listen to Hebrews 11.1. 1. When he gives you this hope, here's what hope is. It's faith is the confidence in what we hope for, and it's the assurance about what we do not see. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, Those who hope in the Lord will re renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. One of the great hymn writers of the church wrote a hymn 185 years ago in England. His name was Edward Moat. He writes these words from personal experience. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Are you standing on the rock this morning? Or are you standing on sinking sand? We are witnesses here today to the profound radical change that God gives hope to the hopeless. He provides a new springtime to those worn out by life and the assurance of this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The empty tomb is a symbol of hope. And this hope is not a passing fad, but a relationship that will last for all eternity. And that is what the empty tomb symbolizes for us today. Truth and hope. But there's one more thing it gives us a symbol of, and that is victory. There is victory in Jesus Christ. We see it as evidenced by the empty tomb. Try to uh, comprehend the amazement of the women who first came to the empty tomb on that resurrection Sunday. <laughs> Try to capture the swell of the emotions for Mary Magdalene when Jesus appeared to her in the garden. Or capture, if you can, the symphony of joy and praise in the upper room when the resurrected Lord appeared to the disciples and he said, Peace, peace to you. And then he looked at Thomas the doubter and he said, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and Put it into my side where that spear went. And then stop doubting and believe. It was an ultimate triumph. The grave could not hold him. He's alive. Jesus is alive and he has triumphed over sin and death. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth as he explains that Christ's victory not only gives us freedom over sin and death, but it will usher us into God's eternal presence someday. 1 Corinthians 15, we read these words.
I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable things. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but, in the twi- but we will be all changed in the flesh, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Stand firm. Remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross at their crucifixion? When the repentant sinner asked, Remember when you come into my kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's triumph. That's victory. And God is still through the finished work of Christ on the cross and the life empowerment of the Holy Spirit doing that in people's lives today. And he wants to do it in your life. If you've never received Christ in your life, he wants to do that in your life today. Those of us in this church who who are celebrating the life going, the eternal life going of Mike Cook, can't help but think of him on this Easter morning as he awakes for his first Easter in heaven. What do you think Mike would say to us today if he could speak throughout this universe? What would he say to us? What is it that he sees this very moment? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, by faith we can see in part, but then we will see face to face. God wants you to share that with him for all of eternity. The empty tomb symbolizes that for us today. It symbolizes truth found in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It symbolizes hope that God loves me and does have a divine purpose for my life. And it symbolizes victory over the power of sin and death for now and forever. And if there's anyone here today who has never surrendered to Jesus Christ, or maybe at some point you did, but you've gone the wrong direction, Jesus is giving you that offer today to come alive in him. If you'll just confess to him, Lord, I do believe. I believe in the resurrection. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he rose again. And I believe he will change my life and I confess my sins. I confess the wrong things I have done. I give them to you, Lord. I lay them at your feet at the foot of the cross. I pray you will come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and guide me so that I may walk 
the road to Calvary with you. Guide me, Lord, that I may discover the life you created me for and fulfill the mission you have for me here on earth. And if you pray that prayer, if you said it as I announced it, you can be assured that Christ is going to do that for you and has done it. And I want to encourage you after the service to go to the welcome uh, table. Out in the foyer, there's a little booklet that says, Peace with God, and it will explain everything that Christ is going to do for you because of your acceptance of him into your life today. Because of your admission of guilt. Because you say, I know I can only live by your grace. The kind of life you created me to live. And he will do that for you. I pray that you will. That is the reason we celebrate this Christmas. <laughs> this Easter. <laughs> it's been a long day, folks. That's why we celebrate this Easter. Celebrate what God has done. And remember these words of the Apostle Paul. He says, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Pray with me. By faith, we receive what you've given us today. By faith, we can ask you into our lives. And by faith, we can leave here today transformed individuals because of the power of the resurrection that comes to us through your Holy Spirit. And I pray that there are those who will make that decision today. Whether here in this room or online listening, to our service. And Father, we give you thanks for this day we celebrate, Easter Sunday, the day of transformation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just remember, church, that if there never was a Christmas, there never would be a resurrection. Amen? I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing victory in Jesus, come on. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, and I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood.
I want to thank you so much for coming to worship Jesus this morning. That's why we're here, right? We have these band members up here, different ones. You don't know them, but we're all brothers and sisters of Christ. We're going to sing one more verse, okay? Here we go. I heard about a man. Come on, sing it. Service at 10. Amen. You're dismissed.